Good evening, everyone, and welcome to City and State's fifth annual 50 Over 50 Awards, presented by AARP New York. Uh, this event is, of course, different <laughs> from before because of the fact that we're on this uh, contraption that I'm trying very, very hard to learn something about. Um, we are now going to recognize 50 New Yorkers who have, who have done a great deal for the city and they deserve this distinguished honor. If the past year has taught us anything, it's experience that does matter. In times of crisis, it's clearer than ever that we need experience. We, all, we do need the new people coming in and it's important to have them, but they need to learn from us too. Anyway, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. First of all, AARP New York. Second, healthcare education, the Healthcare Education Project, Local 94, New York State Laborers, Employers, Cooperation and Education Trust, New York State Laborers Organizing Fund, Pazetsky and Bookman PC, University at Albany, Brown and Weinraub, Chinese American Planning Council, GMHC, JCCA, Northwell Health, Planned Parenthood of uh, the Greater New York Area, Zetlin and Dicciara. Now I'd like to introduce my friend, Beth, Fe Beth Finkel. How are you, Beth? State Great. Director of AARP New York for a few remarks. Hi, Betsy. Thank you so much. So glad to be here uh, with all of you on behalf of AARP. I want to congratulate all of tonight's honoree. I'd like to do a special shout out to Betsy, who's uh, had the original concept for doing this. I can't remember how many years ago that was that we're doing this. And <laughs> oh, also Sorry. And a special thanks to Tom Allen, too, for pulling this together and all these great sponsors that were here together who all want to honor people who are 50 and older, 50 people who've made a huge contribution to New York. AARP believes that we need to change the conversation in this country about what it means to grow older. The way people are aging is changing. Unfortunately, Many of the attitudes and stereotypes about aging are not. Whether you work in government or in a not-for-profit or a big business or a startup, each of you is an age disruptor. You are challenging old stereotypes and attitudes and you're sparking new solutions so more people can choose how they wanna live as they age. You are leading New York's institutions and a few of you yourselves our New York institutions. The 50 New Yorkers we are honoring here tonight are proof that age is not the way we should be judged. No more than any of us want to be judged by our ethnicity or by our gender. It's about our accomplishments. From elected officials to business leaders to advocates for social change, you are the essence of disrupting how our city and state will look at aging. So I wanna share a video with you, another New York institution helmed by someone who found his second act after 50. So away we go to the video. Live from New York, it's Saturday night! Video fix ticket. SNL is the highest mountain I have ever had to climb but it is so much fun climbing. Chris, we're in the center of this. All right, here we go, stand by, folks. I'm Don Roy King. I'm the director of Saturday Night Live. Take one. I have an 18-year-old daughter who keeps me young and relatively hip. It's like a really cool thing that he does, and it's really interesting that the thing that he does is cool in my demographic and my age. Just by definition, I'm more exposed to things I wouldn't be otherwise, and that forces me to stay in touch. Good evening, I'm Seth Myers, and here are tonight's top stories. We get our news the same way. <laughs> and I think that it's really nice that he is up to date in that way, and we can talk about weird pop culture, modern stuff. Yes, 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 yes. And we bring in music acts who are top and latest hit makers who I normally would have lost touch with a long time ago but you still have a little bit of like culture shock sometimes. 
like um, Two Chains was a musical guest one time, and he came home um, from the first day that he met Two Chains and was surprised that there was only one person. He was like, "Where is the other chain?" So the secret is. And like he doesn't even get starstruck that way, you know. He's just like, "Oh, there's this, my buddy now." You know, I worked with this guy, and that's just the situation. And sometimes he'd be like, but "Do you know who that is? Like, do you understand how like amazed you should be?" It is so much fun to be here, and I've developed a much broader eclectic interest in music. Guys, I want to move this chair a little bit. I think that a lot of what he does requires different styles of directing and knowledge of a lot of things. For 21 years, I directed morning television at Good Morning America and then CBS This Morning. I was in my mid-50s, and I thought, I've got to change this lifestyle. CBS agreed, and I moved on. But as I stepped out the door, I thought, now what? I still have skills to offer, I still have bills to be paid, and I still have a desire to find something challenging and definitive. And then I get an opportunity kind of out of nowhere to direct Saturday Night Live. It was sort of a left turn in my career and the need to learn a new skill set, to work with comedians, to stage sketch comedy. And there were moments when I thought, I really don't know what I'm doing here, and I hate that feeling. And I haven't had those butterflies since I was 20. I thought, ooh, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to risk failure. But then I thought, yeah, there's also a chance that I'll come out on the other end of it, where those butterflies turn into the flutter of excitement and pride and the exhilaration of success. I emerged with the most exciting job I could possibly imagine. And I'm so glad I took that risk. I have so much respect for my father and what he does and who he is. My daughter Cameron, whom I adore. And so when I'm that age, I hope to have the same attitude that he does. And that is, you know, to live life to the fullest and to not give up. If I had been given this show 20 years ago, I wouldn't have had the temperament I would have been too defensive. Wait, who are you again? Wait, <laughs> Saturday Night Live is the perfect show for me. Rule 31, take it. At the perfect time in my life. Applause. <laughs> nice job, folks. This crew is following me around. It's the, there's a little bit of a rumor that I might be the next Bachelor. Good luck. <laughs> you enjoyed that. So tonight we celebrate New Yorkers like Don Roy King, who is redefining what it means to age. You are the role models that younger generations will look up <coughs> as they consider how they choose to age. Uh, I want to do a quick shout out to Reggie Nance, who's uh, on my team, who directs all of our uh, age disruption work. Uh, and thank you. And uh, thank you, Gordon. And away we go. I want to congratulate again all the honorees. And now it's really my pleasure to introduce Norman Adler. Now, many of you know him. He's the founder of Bolton St. John's, and he's going to present tonight's first Lifetime Achievement Award. So, Norman, thank you. And take it away. Sure. It's rare that someone who works in government relations is honored with an award. Among the occupations that American mothers hope their children will find employment, Lobbyists are rated somewhere below people who work in a chicken processing plant. Of course, Giorgio De Rosa, who has never processed a chicken that wasn't on his outdoor grill, is a very rare lobbyist. His career that spans some 30 years, all of it Albany-based, attests to his very talents and his many successes. I met Giorgio when he was the political and legislative director for the Public Employees Federation. After working with him for a while, I offered him a job with Bolton St. John's. He was our second hire. 
The first hire was the secretary. Giorgio built the firm into the advocacy juggernaut that it is today. He did this by always being on the cutting edge of technology and of tactics. Where other lobbyists relied on relationships and rabbis, he developed strategic plans that included access to those in the majority and the minority, in the legislature and on the second floor, in agencies and the media. By my calculations, he has survived half a dozen assembly speakers, half a dozen Senate majority leaders, half a dozen governors, and scores, if not hundreds, of commissioners, councils, program staff, and agency personnel, some Republican, some Democrat, and some of whom it was hard to tell. The ace up his sleeve, however, was a trait that was more than just out thinking, out planning, and mastering the issues and information of dozens of clients, often simultaneously. Giorgio De Rosa worked harder and longer than anyone else. Often being a colleague of his was like playing Where's Waldo. He was in Syracuse on Monday, Manhattan Monday night, Brooklyn Tuesday, and who knows where else the rest of the week. With a phone permanently planted in his ear, he was literally a round-the-clock advocate on behalf of his clients and Bolton St. John's. So I give you the only lobbyist honored with a lifetime achievement award this year, and probably any other year, the Dean of the Albany Lobbying Fraternity, my good friend, Giorgio De Rosa. Norman, I, I appreciate the kind words, the introduction. I've, uh, I've known Norman, uh, it seems like my whole adult life. I first uh, met him from a distance as he was the political director of District Council 37 uh, and was arguably the very best lobbyist in, uh, in Albany. Uh, I learned a great deal from him. I remember meeting him at an event uh, that was held for young labor lobbyists and political activists uh, at Bayberry, New York, uh, an event that was put together by the AFL-CAO. I was just a kid, but I remember meeting Norman and, and being incredibly impressed by not just the, the words that uh, he shared with me, but uh, you know his passion for the business. I, uh, I looked at him as a mentor and uh, wanted uh, very much uh, to be half as successful as, uh, as he was. Uh, when Norman asked me to join the firm in uh, 1996, uh, it was a big jumping off point for me. At that time, I had a young family and I remember the words that, uh, that Norman shared with me the day that he made me the offer. Uh, and I said, uh, well, how's this gonna work? And he said, well, we'll give it three years. And if we're not making money, we'll all go our separate ways. And I, it was the first time that I had ever been faced with that kind of a prospect. I had always worked in jobs where I drew a salary and didn't have to worry from uh, month to month where, uh, I, my uh, check was going to be coming from. Uh, and I, I just remember feeling this sense of dread that, oh no, I'm going to have to go out and prove myself uh, month in and month out. I'm going to have to bring in business, something that I'd never done before. And I remember about halfway through that first year uh, talking to Norman and Mel, and they looked at me and said, kid, we're making money. I think this is going to work. Uh, and we never looked back. Bolden was a very small firm at the time, but I remember that first year we fished, finished eighth in the state lobbying rankings and thinking, wow, that's amazing. We uh, were broken to the top 10 our very first year as a uh, practice in Albany, and we never looked back. From that point, we were consistently uh, either second or third and we've been there ever since. It's, uh, it's been an amazing ride. We built the firm from just the three of us into a firm now that consists of over 40 employees. 
one of the most diverse in the state. Uh, when you look at our, uh, our, our website, you see many women, you see African-Americans, Hispanics. Uh, it's truly a, uh, a pleasure to uh, be associated with so many talented people. Uh, the one thing that I can say that I'm most proud of is that we all work very hard. We do a great job of servicing our clients. I can say honestly that uh, we, uh, we work as hard or harder than any firm that's out there and that our clients get their money's worth. Norman, again, I appreciate the opportunity that you gave me. It's hard to believe that all these years later, there are now two uh, DeRosa children that are part of the business and they are not the, the best known uh, DeRosa children. That goes to uh, my, my daughter, who is the uh, secretary to the governor. It's been, uh, it's been a great ride. And uh, again, thank you to the people at city and state for this honor. Okay, thank you, Giorgio. Um, I'd like to now introduce my friend who I haven't seen in a long time. And when I last saw him, he was a councilman in New York and I was presiding. Charles, Baron, how are you? I'm doing fine, it's good to see you. Nice to see you and I'd like you to present your uh, you introduce the lovely lady who's sitting by you, Inez Barron, who is the councilwoman now. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. There, there you go. <laughs> it is indeed my honor and pleasure to present to some, introduce to others, a brilliant, bold, extremely intelligent, African Nubian queen, my leader and my wife, the Honorable Inez Barron. I know the style of the civil rights movement and the black power movements of the 1960s. My mother told her, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud and be involved in that struggle for liberation. She's a daughter of the House of the Lord Church under the leadership of then National Presiding Minister, the Reverend Dr. Herbert Daughtry, and now the Reverend Dr. Karen S. Daughtry is the pastor of the House of the Lord Church. She was chair of the education department in the House of the Lord Church. Why? Because she loves children. She was a member of the <laughs> National Black United Front. Reverend Herbert Daughtry was the chair of the National Black United Front. We organized around a myriad of issues, police brutality, youth jobs, downtown Brooklyn, closing of hospitals and youth centers. And you know what? She put a sign on Mayor Koch's door <laughs> every Martin Luther King day that we marched there, we put a sign on his door saying, take care of the black community. She is also a leadership trainer. Her and I, we, we both started a leadership training company, Dynamics of Leadership. We trained over a hundred thousand youth in college across the nation on leadership skills for the 21st century. Inez is a 36 year member of the Department of Education in New York City, a master teacher for 18 years, retired as a principal. When we campaign out here in East New York and we see some grown people now, they say, that was my teacher. She was the best teacher I ever had. And one young man said, Thank you, Ms. Barron, for having me read the autobiography of Malcolm X because it saved my life. When she retired, she thought she was going to be able to just take care of her garden. Said, no, no, no. East New York wants you to run for political office. So she successfully ran for the New York State Assembly, was in the New York State Assembly for six years. And in that time, she passed legislation that enables Starrett City, now Spring Creek Tower, to stay affordable for decades to come. And then she took my place in the city council, brought in a new school in our district, $100 million, four new parks over $30, $40 million, a youth center, 12,000 units of housing, thousands of jobs. That is her electoral career. 
And now she is one of the co-founders, original founders of Operation Power, people organizing and working for empowerment and respect. And she is what we call the undisputed, undefeated, never lost a race, electoral representative of East New York and the surrounding communities. So I present to you my leader, my wife, the Honorable Inez Barron. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to say hi, Betsy, good to see you. And I wanna thank city and state. And I wanna thank AARP for this recognition. First, I want to say I give honor to God, who is the head of my life and to whom I look each and every day to protect me, direct me, correct me, and favor me. Because when God gives you favor, people who are looking with their natural eye and knowing who you are and what they see as your skills wonder how you're able to move to whatever levels you move to, not knowing that it's God's hand that's directing you and moving you and protecting you. So I say all the glory and honor goes to God who is head of my life. Secondly, I wanna acknowledge my family. My parents raised us with very strict kinds of expectations, high expectations, and made many sacrifices for us so that we would be able to enjoy the benefits of a sound education and understanding from the beginning who we were in terms of our blackness and our connection to Africa. So from a child, I understood that those were the kinds of elements that would be successful to us if we wanted to move forward. I also want to acknowledge all of the students that I've taught over my 36 years with the Department of Education. You helped me to maintain my vitality. You've stimulated my mind. You challenged me to find ways to teach you so that you would grasp the relevance of the information and see its application in your lives. Thank you so much. To my friends that have been there supportive over the years, you know who you are, and I know better than to call names because I'll forget someone, but to all of my friends and family and cousins and extended relatives, thank you so much. But I do have to call out my mom, who this year will be 99, wow. my mother-in-law, Charles's mother, who this year will be 98, and to my first mother-in-law, who this year will be 100 years mm. old. All of them are still living, still in my life, and still very much supportive of what I do. Uh, I just want to say that as I've moved through the electoral arena, I've had models that have been an inspiration for me. I've looked at the life of the radical Dr. Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. not the Martin Luther King that was frozen in time and I have a dream, moving through all of those years to the point where he saw that this country needed a radical revolution mm -hmm. and needed to have a redistribution of the resources right. to the people who were most oppressed. So I have Dr. Martin Luther King as a model. I think of Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a model who talked about the advantage and the importance of local politics and getting involved locally. And I think about the radical Shirley Chisholm who understood that yes, she had a label of a political party, but that political party was not going to advance her because she was unbought and unbossed. Right. But most recently, I look at the model that my husband has presented to be someone who's speaking truth to power, to be someone who is unafraid mm -hmm to challenge those injustices that exist, to call them out, to confront them, and to offer another paradigm for how we can work to bring justice for our society, for those who are the most oppressed, and for those who have the greatest need, and how we have to push to make sure that the system of economics, capitalism that we're using now, which as Dr. Martin Luther King said, is one of the isms, one of the evils. We've got to make sure that we push to bring benefits and, pro and, and proper resources to our communities. So I'm so pleased again to be a recipient, to have been uh, singled out for this. And it says a lifetime award, and I thank you for that. But I just wanna say 
It's a life up to this point. It's not ended. And so, yes, we're talking about 50 over 50, but perhaps you want to look at another category, 75 over 75, because this year I will be 75. And I believe that the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. And as long as I've got breath in my body, I'm going to continue to do the work that God has called me to do. So I say, Lord, I'm available. I look forward to spending time with my grandchildren who are five, three, and three weeks old, <laughs> but I'm available to what God has called me to do because he's put a purpose on my life and I want to be able to fulfill the purpose that he has for my life. So thank you once again for this tribute and for this honor. And to the other honorees, congratulations to you as well. Thank you, God bless. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Inez. Thank you, Charles. You're a wonderful New York couple. And thank congratulations to you. And thank Charles, you. thank heavens you married her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad she said yes. <laughs> uh, I'd like to now introduce my great friend who needs no introduction. Uh, that is Richard Ravitch, who, as you all know, was chairman of the M MTA, was the uh, um, I guess he was Lieutenant Governor, I can't remember for how many years, but the most important thing about Dick Ravitch is he's my dear, dear friend. Hi, I don't see my picture up. Um, I'll start, I'm getting up there, I am. Now you can see me. Um, in 2008, when Elliot Spitzer was elected governor, uh, a few weeks afterwards, uh, my secretary said to me, there's a guy by the name of Pat Foy on the phone. And uh, I wasn't that busy. I don't normally take calls from strangers, but I picked it up and he said um, that um, he was going to be the chairman of UDC uh, in the Spitzer administration. And he knew that I had uh, been the first chairman of UDC and saved it from. Uh, the threat of bankruptcy two years after it was created. And he wanted to talk to me about, should he take the job? What could be done with it, etc. So my memory is that we had lunch um, and uh, he was incredibly bright, asked all the right questions, um, clearly had all the right values to go into public life and uh, uh, deal with complicated economic uh, issues um, that would create inevitably some kind of tension with some part of the political system. Uh, I was very impressed and uh, he took the job and occasionally uh, we would have lunch um, and he'd ask my advice or my help which I was more than delighted to give. And I was thrilled that um, somebody of his competence was um, running that agency. And then years later, even better, I got a call from Pat and he said, he's gonna be chairman of the MTA. Well, I said, my God, uh, that uh, was so important that somebody of his, not just in talent, but integrity and independence would assume the chairmanship in a difficult time. It was a difficult time for three reasons. One, they were out of money. Two, they had a governor, in my opinion, who was not doing what he should have done to help the MTA, particularly with respect to its capital program. But Pat nonetheless took the job oh, and it became an even more adverse situation when we got into the fiscal problems that we have been, we have been facing in New York and nationally. Um, and then it got even worse when the COVID hit and the subways were empty and there was no revenue or very little revenue. Um, I'll never forget, I asked my grandson how he got to and from school, and he looked at me and he said, the subway, Grandpa. And I said, well, it isn't safe. Or do you wash your hands and keep wearing a mask? He said, Grandpa, they're empty. 
and I said, I called Pat and I told him the story and he told me that ridership was down over 50%. Uh, and the, without that revenue, it was in terrible trouble. And he then made a very gutsy decision. He had no alternative. Uh, he borrowed money um, for, on a three-year basis with no assurance he could pay it back. Um, and um, I can only say, when I was asked to uh, introduce Pat, um, it took me no more than one second to say, it was an honor because he is the quintessential, uh, brilliant, honorable public servant. No, I'm. Uh, I'm th th thanks, Dick, uh, and thanks for taking my call back in uh, 2006. Uh, Chairman Ravage is one of the great public servants of the last uh, 50 years. Uh, he saved New York City. He saved the Urban Development Corporation and he saved the MTA. Uh, I'm going to be brief. Uh, I want to thank city and state and AARP for this award. I accept this honor on behalf of 60,000 MTA first line employees who each individually deserve lifetime achievement awards for day to day heroism for moving New York through the worst days of the pandemic. Each of our colleagues has done extraordinary work. Uh, which has helped bring the city back and carried essential workers and first responders to their critical duties during the pandemic. Uh, yesterday, my colleague Sarah Feinberg uh, revealed a touching uh, digital memorial to our colleagues who passed away uh, to the virus. Uh, we should remember every public servant at the MTA, police department, fire department, uh, Board of Education and throughout the city and the state who passed from the virus. Uh, I thank you for this award and let's remember uh, the frontline employees of the MTA. Thanks, Dick, and thanks, city and state. Thanks a lot, Pat. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm amazed that you're still thanking him after all these years and the most difficult jobs probably in New York City. Anyway, there's another great friend of mine that I get to introduce and, and another very talented public servant, and that is Carl Weisbrod. Carl? Um, thank you, Betsy, and uh, my congratulations to all of the um, honorees, the distinguished honorees tonight. Um, I just want to reiterate what Dick said about Pat Foy and his management during this crisis at the MTA. But it's my distinct privilege to introduce our next honoree, Marisa Lago. Marisa has been my friend and colleague for more than three decades, which for each of us is not quite a lifetime, but nevertheless a very good chunk of time. And I am so thrilled to see her deservedly recognized by city and state tonight. Marisa is, to use a football analogy, a triple threat. She has been a star at all three levels of government in New York City, New York State, and in our federal government. And to use a baseball analogy, Marisa is a five-tool player. She's a brilliant lawyer, a first-rate administrator, a fearsome advocate, an innovative policymaker, and a very thoughtful colleague. Within the past few weeks, we have appropriately celebrated David Dinkins for among other things, negotiating the deal that kept the US Open Tennis Center here in New York City, and which is generally recognized as perhaps the best municipal sports deal of all time in the country. What few people will remember is that Marisa Lago drafted that lease. And what even fewer people will remember is that Marisa had to defend that lease before it was signed, while it was still not final, before 51 members of the city council, each of whom had the opportunity to play lawyer for a day. The result, not a single word of the lease was changed. That's Marisa, she is indefatigable. Whether she's climbing a mountain, running a rapids, helping to shape treasury and securities regulations in remote corners of the globe that most of us have never even heard of, or managing a city or state agency she is all in with all her heart and all her soul. And that is particularly true with respect to New York City, where she was born, grew up, and went to college. She has been virtually everywhere in the world serving our country, 
but New York is the place she loves. I know everyone who is being honored tonight works hard. Most public officials, contrary to public opinion, do. We all know that. Working hard for most of us is 50, maybe 60, maybe pushing it 70 hours a week. For Marisa Lago, it's 100 hours a week. And she has demonstrated that commitment time and time again in her current role as chair of the City Planning Commission. To cite just two examples, she expertly steered the rezoning of the Jerome Carter uh, Avenue Carter in the Bronx with Council Member Vanessa Gibson and the Bay Street Carter in Staten Island with Council Member Debbie Rose, um, bringing badly needed affordable housing and quality open space to neighborhoods as different as these two are. And each of these neighborhood plans stands as signal achievements of the de Blasio administration. I could cite many, many other examples of her devotion to public service and to New York City, but we would be here literally all night. And I will just conclude by saying, I am so proud to know Marisa Lago and so honored to be introducing her tonight. Marisa. Carl, my soulmate, thank you so much. And city and state, thank you for the great honor of being part of tonight's distinguished group of honorees. I'm absolutely humbled. While my body clock may say that I'm over 50, 65 actually, my state of mind and spirit are as passionate, curious, and irreverent as when I worked for Carl as a 30-something. So I absolutely love my new moniker as an age disruptor. It encapsulates for me the importance as a public servant of never accepting the status quo, of always striving to make our world a better place. My remarks will focus on the fundamental importance of public service to our American way of life, the sacrifices public servants make, and the stability and promise that their work offers to our city, our state, our nation. Case in point, Greg Meeks and Jerry Nadler, distinguished members of Congress who refused to be intimidated by armed marauders storming the US Capitol, instead working through the night to ensure that our country would see a peaceful transfer of presidential power. We are indebted to you. I first experienced the value of public service in my childhood home. After serving in the Navy during World War II, my father, indebted. spent the next 40 years as a civilian employee of the Department of Defense. I grew up seeing Luis's pride in serving his country. I also saw how Luis, like my mother Marushina, a proud graduate of New York City Public High Schools, relied on a blue collar civil service job to raise a family of four children, confident of a steady paycheck and of health benefits. I first became a public servant in 1973 as an entry level temporary typist. In the intervening 48 years, I've held a wide array of government positions including the honor of having been confirmed by the US Senate and representing the Treasury Department in countless international negotiations. Along the way, I've had the distinct privilege of serving three path-blazing African-American leaders, Mayor David Dinkins, Governor David Patterson, and President Barack Obama. My interest in the city's built form was nurtured by my college years at Cooper Union when this physics major fell in love with an architecture student, Ron Finu, my mate of 46 years. My specific interest in planning and economic development was sparked by my law school property law professor and dear friend, Lance Liebman. He opened my eyes to the injustices of slum clearance under the guise of urban renewal, something that I'd witnessed throughout my coming of age in New York. Lance in turn introduced me to Herb Sturz, who then wore the two hats that I wear today. It was her who taught me a fundamental tenet of government leadership, that the best public service of servants always think of those they serve, the public. He showed by example how a leader in government can creatively deploy the powerful levers of government, not for private gain, not for accolades, but to advance the public good. And another of the great public servants of our time is Carl Weisbrod, my friend, my mentor, and my absolutely favorite boss of all time. 
Carl is my immediate predecessor as chair of the Planning Commission and director of the Department of City Planning. And I am so deeply honored that Mayor de Blasio gave me the opportunity to serve the city that I so love for the third time and to follow in the footsteps of Herb and Carl. So let me now turn to the remarkable public servants at the Department of City Planning. DCP staffers dedicate their professional careers to improving the lives of others. Those New Yorkers who are already here and those who, like my husband's and my families, arrived here from other corners of the globe. The DCP team looks at the city as it is today, works to improve it in the near term, and plans for the city that we want to be 10, 20, 50 years from now. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, more than one quarter of the DCP team have repeatedly volunteered to help their fellow New Yorkers through these harsh months. I thank them. The DCP team brings their expertise, creativity, and dedication to work each day. They certainly don't do it for the glory. They do it for their neighbors, for our city, and for their commitment to a better tomorrow. While I'm the person here tonight receiving this award, I view it as welcome recognition of the remarkable team of public servants, the Patriots, at the Department of City Planning. So again, I thank you for this honor. Wow, Marissa, that was a terrific lesson in, in all the things that you've done in your, in your incredibly interesting and very, very valuable service to the city of New York. Anyway, thank you. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Sheila Siri, Vice President of Government and Community Relations at the University of Albany, who will introduce Habidan Rodriguez, the President of the University at Albany. Thank you, Betsy. It's a pleasure to be able to introduce the next honoree, University at Albany President Avidan Rodriguez. I have had the honor of working closely with Dr. Rodriguez since he took office as UAlbany's 20th president in September, 2017. In doing so, he became the first Latino president of a four-year SUNY campus, a milestone made all the more meaningful by UAlbany's extraordinarily diverse student body and Dr. Rodriguez's own childhood years spent in the Bronx. In the years since, he has committed to working collaboratively to maximize UAlbany's engagement with its community and to make our university no less than the nation's leading diverse research institution. Prior to coming to UAlbany, Dr. Rodriguez was the founding provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Before that, he built a reputation as a respected scholar researching the socioeconomic impacts of disasters and the economic well-being of minority populations in the mainland United States and Puerto Rico. A native of Puerto Rico and first generation college student himself, Dr. Rodriguez is focused every day on SUNY's core mission to deliver an accessible, affordable, and excellent college education to every New Yorker who wants one. I consider myself lucky to be able to share the important work with him. With that, please welcome my boss, Avedon Rodriguez. Thank you so very much, Sheila. And thank you for everything that you do for the university at Albany, for our communities and for our state. Your collaborations and friendship are greatly appreciated. I also wanna thank city and state for inviting me to be part of this event with so many distinguished leaders from across our great state. Congratulations to this awards, uh, this evening's award winners, or as we say in Spanish, felicidades. It is an honor to be among this distinguished group. When I think about how I came to be among tonight's awardees, I see the faces of so many people who supported me along my life's journey. Through this award, we are honoring them for their great work, their sacrifices, and important contributions. From my family, my wife of 35 years, Rosie, my children who have provided great support, love, and encouragement during the past three decades. My mentors and colleagues who over the years helped ignite my passion for the work that we do to better serve our communities the students I have taught from whom I have learned so much 
They inspire my work and are a strong motivation to work even harder every day with a focus on student success. I am also very grateful to the great institutions where I spent my career and the communities I have had the opportunity to join and to serve. I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to find a home in New York the state where I spent several years of my childhood. The capital region and the state of New York have so much to offer, and it is a privilege to be the, the leader and the president of the university at Albany, such a great institution that is here to serve our communities in the capital region, in the state of New York, across the nation, and indeed across the globe. And it's fantastic to be part of the great state university of New York system. All this to say that my success and my accomplishments have been possible through the commitment, support, hard work, sacrifice, and love from so many people throughout my journey. I am so indebted to all of them and absolutely delighted to be among tonight's awardees. Again, thank you to city and state for including me with this illustrious group. And to my fellow awardees, thank you for your collective contributions in your respective fields and industries. And thank you for all that you do for our communities. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and stay engaged. Muchisimas gracias. Thank you all so very much. Thank you and congratulations to you. Um, now, some of our honorees could not be here tonight, yet I do think we should acknowledge them. Um, and uh, I, I want to first talk about my great friend, uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks, who is now head of the Foreign Relations um, Committee in, in the House. And that is a great, uh, great job for him. And he's a great man. I'm sorry he can't be here. Congressman Jerry Nadler, my congressman, and I don't, can't say enough about him. Um, State Senator Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins, and finally, Larry Brown, President and CEO of One Brooklyn Health System. None of them could be here tonight, but I did want to acknowledge them and say congratulations. Uh, Senator Mayor, I think we have to wait a little bit because Liz is not, has not arrived yet, so I will go on and read very uh, quickly and hopefully articulately uh, the names of some of the other awardees. And I guess Liz, will, you'll jump in if she, when she arrives. Is that the way we're doing it? Oh, okay. Uh, here we have a presentation of the winners. These individuals have committed decades of their lives to making New York a better place. They have distinguished themselves many times over and provide unparalleled experience and expertise in their fields. Be sure to shout out your winner in the chat, whatever that is. I'm not technically, technologically advanced at all. So first of all, we have Kirk Adams, Director, Healthcare Education Project of 1199 SEIU. Karen Alford, Vice President for Elementary Schools and Director of UFT United Community Schools. Nancy Ares, Professor, Baruch College, Mark School of Public and International Affairs, Eric Aranon, partner, Strook and Strook and Levan, Jonathan Ballin, co-chair, public and project finance group, Cozen O'Connor, Ray Barbieri, chief program officer, JCCA, Brad Beckstrom, senior director, government and community affairs, Mount Sinai Health System, Jonathan Bing, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, Robert Bookman, partner Pazetsky and Bookman, co-founder and general counsel of the New York City Hospitality and Alliance. Leroy Comrie, my old pal, New York State Senator. Robert Carnegie, Jr., council member, New York City Council. Ross Fromer, vice president, government and community affairs and associate dean, Columbia University. Lisa Gilday, chief operating officer, Birch Family Services. William Gorin, Senior Counsel, Clary Gottlieb, Rhonda Harris, Senior Vice President, People, Operations and Compliance, Gay Men's Health Crisis, Jim Hirani, President Hirani Group, Oma Holloway, Senior Program Manager, Bridge Street, 
Development Corporation, Ted Houghton, President, Gateway Housing, John Hutchings, New York State Laborers Direct, Director of Organizing and, and PAC, New York State Laborers Organizing Fund, Patrick Jenkins, founder, Patrick Jenkins Associate, Patricia Jordan, the Emma Bowen Community Center, Sabrina Canner, Executive Vice President of Development at Brookfield, Steve Kramer, President, Get Out the Vote, Stephen Kroll, Chief Delivery, Delivery Officer at UCM Digital Health, Steve Melito, Partner and Chair of New York State Government Relations Group, Dave, Davidoff, Hutcher, and Citron, and John Mascliano, Shareholder, Greenberg, Traurig, LLP, Carla Matero, Chief of Staff, Casira, LLC, Marcy McCall, Director, NYC Outreach Services, New York State Health Department, Meryl McGee, Chief Equity and Engagement Officer, Planned Parenthood, Ray Mellon, Senior Partners, Zetlin and Dichira, Gary Moriwaki, Wendell Marks, Paul Lingen, Associate Executive Director, Chinese American Planning Council, Avra Rice, President and CEO, New York Urban League, Carmen Rivera, Chief Vocational and Community Affairs Officer of, of BIP Community Services, Howard Rothschild, President, Reality Advisory Board on Labor Relations, Dawn Skeet Walker, Associate Vice President of Communications and Marketing, SUNY Downstate Sciences University, Jimmy Vaca, Professor, former City Council Member, <clears throat> Queens College, Scott Wexler, Managing Director, Ostrov Associates, Inc., Dennis Whalen, Vice President of State Government Affairs, Northwell Health, Wanda Williams, Special Assistant to the President, Local 1549 of AFSME. Uh, and I wonder, um, hmm, Shelley, is, has Liz popped in? I don't see her. Betsy, and no one has sent me a note yet, so um, it's up to um, you. I don't think she's going to be able to join us, unfortunately. She was pulled away, um, and um, so, Senator, if you'd still like to say a few words about her, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, Shelley, go ahead, uh, please. Liz is one of the great public servants in the state of New York and lives in the city, but uh, why don't you introduce her and we'll, we'll give her a shout out. Well, thank you. Thank you, City and State, for uh, recognizing NAARP, my great colleague and friend, Senator Liz Kruger, who the reason she isn't here is because today's the first day of budget hearings for all of us on this call. Many of us know this, but it started at 930 and it is a long way from done. And Liz, as the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, along with our other assembly colleagues, is leading uh, this hearing on behalf of the Senate majority. So. Liz, the ultimate public servant, can't be here because she's doing the people's work. But let me just say a few things about Liz and also about our leader, Senator Andre Stewart Cousins, who I'm so thrilled is being honored here today. Um, as you said, Betsy, Liz really is a, the sort of ultimate of the age disruptors. I call her just the policy disruptor. She is really committed to using public policy to make good. And she has done it with optimism, with persistence, with a sense of humor, which is quite remarkable for the number of years she was in the minority, and with a commitment to really making sure good things happen in government. And I am so uh, indebted to her friendship and her leadership uh, to getting us to this point. People may remember she was elected in February of 2002 from the East Side in a special election after she lost a close race two years previous to Roy Goodman. And she got into the Senate in, again in the minority after serving for uh, 15 years at the Community Food Resource Center and the founding director of the New York City Food Bank and a leader on these issues. When she got into the Senate in the minority, for those of you who remember, we really had no power. And Liz did not let that stop her. She just thought if she was persistent and had humor and persuaded her colleagues, her Republican colleagues, she could get some things and she did. Uh, credit to her for the years I have known Liz, which is uh, about 15 years, I have never seen her lose her cool. Even when attacked and criticized, she has a very thick skin, which is really right for the job because she doesn't take it personally. She sees it as part of a bigger mission. 
and she just pursued. One thing I get a kick out of during the time in the minority, she was at one point the head of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee, and she sort of found um, Senator Andrea Stewart Cousins. And she has a great quote in here uh, in the Times of that year saying, the truth was that Andrea Stewart Cousins was such an extraordinary candidate. She simply convinced us basically to invest in her. And she has been a strong proponent for ensuring our conference is diverse and representative of all the people of New York. So it's been such a pleasure to have Liz as a friend and I'm so thrilled that you're honoring her. She truly is unique in her style, in her ability to get things done and in her real optimism and belief that public servants and public service is worth it. She feels, she told me when I said I may have to speak with her to remind people how honored and humbled she is to have this position and to be able to speak on behalf of the people she represents and in fact, all the people of New York. So I'm so pleased you could honor her. She is so deserving and it's really a pleasure. We will miss her, but we know she's asking hard questions of, uh, certainly I saw people earlier from the MTA and from New York City Transit and uh, doing the work that she is, she is just committed to doing. So thank you, Betsy. Thank you to city and state and AARP and congratulations to all of the other awardees and honorees, such a wonderful bunch. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Shelly. Um, well, I guess now we can have closing remarks. And once again, I can congratulate everybody who got the award tonight. Um, we, have, we have ended earlier than we should, uh, but of course I always pride myself on that. Um, I, I know many of you have much to do tonight, um, and dinner is, is being served in many places, I think. Uh, but let me again thank our sponsors in particularly, uh, AARP and Beth Finkel, who is a tireless advocate for her, her constituents and for the rest of us. Uh, the Healthcare Educational Project, Local 94, New York State Laborers, Employers Cooperative, sorry, New York State Laborers, Employers Cooper Co 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 Cooperation and Education Trust. That's a, that's a tough one. New York State Laborers Organizing Fund, uh, Pazetsky and Bookman PC, University of Albany, Brown and Weinraub, Chinese American Planning Council, GMHC, JCCA, and Northwell Health. Thank you all so much for, oh, sorry, I've forgotten some. Planned Parenthood of New York, one of the most important uh, institutions in, this, in New York City, Zelton and Dichara. Anyway, thank you for your support and for sponsoring this event. And uh, I hope everybody stays safe. I have had COVID, just so you know that. It is not fun, but I'm here. And uh, I wanna wish you all the best, uh, the, be the best of times and stay safe and good night. <laughs>